this, this writing is about 10 years later that Paul is writing to the church at Philippi. And Paul's writing to the church because he, Paul is in prison and he's trying to encourage the church to go on with the Lord while he's in prison. You'd think the focus would be on Paul. Paul is just a unique, Paul is just a rare breed, man. Paul is just wired different. That's all I can tell you. That a man's in prison and he's, try, and he's writing to the church because they eventually they took away Paul's preaching. And they tried to stop a man from preaching, but they didn't know it. Paul's greatest weapon was his pen. See, when the enemy tried to stop you, God will make a way where there is no way. And who knew that Paul's pen would be what we're reading today? We are today living what Paul wrote in pen. Amen? So let me, let's go on with this. Let me, let me start in Philippians chapter 1. It's going to be four weeks, two, three, four. You can catch it real easy. Chapter 1, it says this. Paul's writing this. He says, and he's right. I want to report to you, friends, he's giving them the letter, that my imprisonment here had the opposite of his intended effect. They thought they would shut Paul down. So instead of being squelched, the message of the gospel has actually prospered. They thought they were going to kill this thing, but in reality, it actually birthed and prospered. All the soldiers here and everyone else found out that I am in jail because of the Messiah, because of Christ. Uh, they, they aroused their curiosity. They picked their, 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 their curiosity was aroused, and now they have learned all about him being Christ. Not only that, most of the followers of Jesus here have become far more assured of themselves in their faith than ever, speaking out fearlessly about God and about the Messiah, Christ, who I preach. Let me stop right here for a moment. Paul is saying, here it is. I am in prison, and I am surrounded by 16 guards, eight hours a day with three shifts, four on this side, four on the left, four on the right, and four on the front. So I have 16 guards, and they're actually chained to me. And every eight hours, a new eight come in. So Paul says, I have to find a purpose while I'm here. So he says, you know what? While I'm here, I'll just go preach about Christ. I have a captivated audience. They can't go anywhere. <laughs> and so eight hours, they can't even go, yang, yang, yang. They can't even do that because they're captivated. So while they're there, and I guess what, every eight hours, I get, a new, I get a new set of people. And so what the enemy thought, he was going to take me down because I had purpose. I didn't look at it as all about me, but it was about him. And I said, in the moment, I'm going to get my eye off on me and put my eye on him. And because of this, other people have found out about this and they were a little timid about speaking on their job site or whatever. But they said, you know what? If Paul can do this in prison, then why can't I speak about the Lord on my job? Right. And while I'm doing my thing, why can't I just stop being on a platform and preach? But why can't I just share and be the light? So Paul said, those who were feared were now going, you know what? Boldness came on them because, you know what? If Paul can do this, then why can't I, who am free, can do anything? Amen? Here we go. So I've given you an update. So you see what's happening? So he's writing this, all right? And so this, is, this is the part you can catch. It's true that some here preach Christ because without me, out of the way, they preach because I'm not here. They think they write in the spotlight. He says, look, some people preach because they push you out of the way. They want to get in the spotlight. Paul says, okay, it don't matter. It don't matter. Life's short. Let it go. Whew. But the others do it the best, and some others do the best in their heart, and the best they can. That's me and Bonnie. We just try to do the best we can. We're not the, we're not the greatest, but we, just, we want to just do the best we can. One group is motivated by pure love, knowing that I am here defending the message of the gospel and wanting to help out. Some people just have pure hearts. Okay, it's all right. And, and, and some, and, and some uh, do it out of just bad motive. They're trying to just get ahead of them. Why? They see it as a competition. And so the worst goes out before me, and all the, the worst comes out of it. But it doesn't matter. Paul said, listen, some preach this or some preach that. 
Jimmy might preach this over here. Trevor might preach this over here. This one might preach this. Chris might preach this over here. Listen, they may not all be the same, but guess what? If Christ is being preached, we win. Amen. See, Paul didn't have competence. He said, listen, it don't matter. Why? He said, look, here's my philosophy. Why can't every church grow and multiply and become, why, why can't the other church down the street be better than me? I don't really care. Because why? If Christ is gained and preached, guess what? We win. Amen? And that's what Paul was saying. He said, hey, listen, it's okay. Because, well, you know, like, hear me out. Life's short. Life's short, man, to worry about petty and your little bull. That's what Paul was getting at. Life's short, man. Look, for Paul, some preach for their own gain. They, want, they preach and they get money from it. Some people do this. Paul said, hey, it's okay. It's all right. If they preach it, it's okay. Don't, don't, uh, don't have a baby. Don't freak out. He said, look, don't freak out. He said this, um, every time that somebody speaks and opens his mouth, Christ is proclaimed, this is verse 18, so I just cheer them on. Wow. You hear Pastor Trevor down the street is doing three services. Instead of going, oh, wonder what's going on now, I cheer them on. Trevor, go get four services, man. Come on, that's what he's saying. I cheer them on. They, why? Because if they're winning people to Christ, I don't care. I, I, I don't, it doesn't matter how they win them. They just win them. Sometimes you're going you to ask somebody and get pride out of the way, and I'm learning that. they are going to ask somebody, how are you doing it? How are you winning people, man? Because why? Paul says a kingdom of God can't be territorial. Because when it is, competition comes in, and you lose. Yeah. And the enemy wins. He says, but if you can cheer people on, you can bless them. That's how you know your heart's right. You can ride by as a church and go, Lord, touch that church and God, multiply him. Let them win souls for the kingdom of God. That's God testing you going, oh, hey, it really ain't about you. Yeah. yeah, and so what? You know what? Pastor's going to make him a tour this week. And pastor's going to go to every church. And I'm going to go and bless every church. Amen. Because Why? I want to win for Jesus. <laughs> Amen. So your pastor is going to ride around this week. You see me riding around. I'm not joining other churches. I'm not, I'm not cursing them. I'm actually speaking blessings over them. Because why? I want to be like Paul. Every time one of them opens their mouth, Christ is proclaimed. So I just cheer them on instead. <laughs> yeah. Now I can't see the paper. I'm crying. Oh, man. Come on. <laughs> That's all right. It's the Holy Ghost. I love it. It's the Holy Ghost. So listen, I am going to keep on celebrating it because why? I know how it's going to turn out. Amen. You, see, you see, Paul, it couldn't take Paul's joy, man. <laughs> it's Paul says, you ain't taking my joy, man. I refuse it, amen, because my joy is in Christ. He says, through your faithful prayers, and this is the, he knows why, because the Philippian church were praying for him. Because why? It was Paul's baby. Through your faithful prayers and your generous response of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, everything he wants to do in and through will be done. Verse 20, here it is. I can hardly wait to continue on my course. Paul, you're chained. I don't expect to be embarrassed in the least. On the contrary, here it comes in. Here it comes the message. Everything happening to me in this jail only serves to make Christ more accurately known. I am not there yet. I am not there yet, God. I am not. I want to be, but I'm not there yet. Whether I live or die, Christ is gained. Yeah. And this is in, in verse 21. Is, well, I did it in the message, but if you do it in the K, uh, KJV or NIV, it says, uh, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That was purpose. Paul said, here it comes down to. In this life, I have a mission. And like my, my wife said, God only knows the time and days that you have. And everything's marked down in the calendar. that you're not going to live one breath before God's timing. But Paul said, when this life's over, there's another journey that I'll begin. And that you will spend more eternity than you're here on earth. Listen, what you do here, you're being prepared for the big dance. People used to tell me, uh, I'm all dressed up and nowhere to go. You're all dressed up, and honey, you got somewhere to go in Jesus' name. Amen? 
Amen. And so I want to, uh, so it's, I'm going to talk about, per, but I'm going to kill some arguments today because I believe that when the Lord gave me this, uh, he whittled out some things. And I want you to demolish a couple of your arguments here today. So it's not going to be all up. It's going to be about purpose. And some of this contact is out of the Purpose Driven uh, book by Rick Warren. Some books have changed your life, and this is one of them that changed your pastor's life. I've dug into this book. I've, I've, I've meditated. I've underlined a lot of stuff. Because in life, we go in life asking, what is my purpose? Like, what do I do? I mean, am I just a blot on the calendar here? And so I'm gonna, one, one of the arguments I want to uh, take away today is this, that you're not an accident. I've heard this so many times in counseling and, 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 and hearing people saying that my mom and dad told me I wasn't playing, that was an accident. And that word spoke over you and it, it, it told you something that you really didn't matter. That we planned so-and-so, but we didn't plan you. Like I tell you, we planned Aaron, but, Be- but Beth Ann... Oh, I was, Lord, they told me she was, uh, Bonnie was only, uh, we were like 15 months old uh, when, uh, when, uh, when Beth was born. I was sweating it out, man. I was thinking two kids in diapers. I'm like, Lord, we planned, we planned Aaron, but Beth, then I realized, uh-uh. She was the best accident Beth, Beth was the best accident I've ever had. Yeah. <laughs> it was, you see I'm coming? Because sometimes the enemy will get in your mind and tell you that you was not, you didn't exist, that you just went after. We planned that, but you just came along out of nowhere. Honey, we didn't even want you. And that, and that word has crushed you. That's what the Holy Spirit says. So I'm speaking to people today, but it may not be you exactly, but maybe somebody on YouTube or social media tonight. And the word, the word says this. This is the word of Jeremiah. I'm going to give you word today. Word takes care of things, okay? Word. And Jeremiah 1.4 says this. It says that I formed you before you were born in your mother's womb. I formed you. I formed you. I knew about you before you were even born. Because I formed you, I called you to a purpose. You see, many times, you've got to understand this. Your birth was no mistake or no mishap. Your parents have, may have not planned you. Say, but God. But God. But God did. Your parents may have not planned you, but I just overruled them. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Look at, Jer- look at Psalms 139. It talks about, David is writing this about, uh, and I thought about this with the little birth of little Emerson this week. It hit me. This, this one grabbed me. Oh, yes. You shaped me inside and then out. We see that. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you, high God. You're breathtaking. Body and soul. I am marvelously made. You got to grab that, man. This is demolishing all you, Mrs. One. You are marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. God's responding back saying, wow, what a creation I just did. See, demolish arguments. You know me inside and out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit. How it was sculptured from what? Nothing into something. Wow, come on. you got to receive this, man. You guys got to break down some, some mental uh, lines in your mind. Like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. In the days of my life, all but pay before you, I would live that day, that one day. Whew. Let me tell you, you have to understand this. That everything begins with God. Today, everybody wants to take God out of the situation. God is not the starting point. God is the source. You see, one day, like a prodigal, you came to your senses. Amen? And when you come to your senses, something happened. I was born for just more than just be a a meter reader at the gas company. That's my function. That's what I do for a living. That's not my purpose. 
That's my function. That's what I do. I could be the best meter reader, the best mailman, the best whatever. It doesn't matter. That's not your calling. That is your function, what you do to bring home money for your, for your family so what you can have a purpose that I take care of my family. That job is just a function. That's not your calling. That's just a function of what you do. Amen? Amen. So Paul was saying, this, he was saying, listen, you've got to understand this, that you have to whittle out mental lines in your mind of philosophies and world's wisdom and start opening your eyes to godly wisdom. Why do you think we're doing this purple book? Because we have nothing to do? No. It's, it's taking lies and bringing them into truth. And when the truth will set you free or make you miserable and run to the cross. I found out the truth will set you free or the truth will just make you miserable. And you make you miserable enough to say, what are we going to do about it? Where's the cross? Amen? And I, want to, I, I, I had to make this clear because sometimes people don't realize, listen, you were not an accident. God was thinking about you before you even thought about him. Here you go. Do you know that you, uh, he planned the time and date and everything about you, where you were going to be born at, which city, what hospital, that was not an accident. You see, you may choose your career, you may choose your spouse, you may choose your hobbies of life, you may choose anything, but you never got a chance to choose your purpose. Because your purpose was for him. Because there's a revelation, I hate to tell you this, but it's not all about you, it's all about him. <laughs> and that's what Paul figured out. It wasn't about Paul, it was about the Christ in Paul. Amen? And so here it is. Let's see, here it is. While there are many illegitimate parents, there are no illegitimate children. That's word. It might be legitimate parents, but there's no legitimate kids. No, 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 no. Why? God doesn't make mistakes. He don't. So I'm, I'm demolishing arguments here this morning because arguments, where arguments are at? Right, yes. See, you, your parents told you were on plan, but God said, no, they were playing, trust me. <laughs> They were planned. You see, nothing is done by accident with him. He doesn't make mistakes. And you're not a mistake. You're not some blot on the calendar that, and it, here's a problem, I'm going to get into the problem in a few minutes. There's an identification problem of a culture in this world today. Why? You get, people don't know if they're male or female. I'm, I'm going to get into this in a minute. I'm, I'm, a warm, I'm, I'm getting you ready. I'm putting on the burn in a minute. Hang on. Here we go. All right, listen. It's about identity. And people right now have no identity. And so what happens when you have no identity, you don't know why you exist. See, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a scheme of the enemy. It's, it's a question with a question with a question and never answer. No answer, no answer, no answer. Okay? And here it is. A, a couple of things I'm going to share with you this morning. Knowing your purpose, it focuses you on your life. Knowing your purpose, you get focused. So many people are scatterbrained today. Really. They are just out there. And Paul came to a place that he, he had to come to a place where in your focus, you concentrate on what you need and you are, be, you are selective of what you don't need. Because why you focus? Paul said this. He's going to, Brother Stanley's going to preach on that. I focus on this. Leave what's behind me behind me, and I focus that what's ahead of me. Because why? Paul killed people for a living, Christians. How do you think Paul would have felt? Paul said, if I focus on my past, look who I was in my past. I used to walk around so zealous for God that I thought God was doing God a favor by going in the house, kicking doors down, and grabbing out Christians and killing them. Paul said, you don't think I, you don't think I was, sometimes you can get focused on the wrong thing. Yeah. And I've learned this, and I'm learning this. 
if you want to go further in life, you got to be very selective what you focus on. Just because you got a lot of creativity on here don't mean that you're productive. A lot of people can be busy running around a circle chasing themselves like this. And you know, I've learned that. that, that I'm, the enemy would rather have you run around a mountain, chase a mountain for 40 years, than go straight through a lawn. Really. And, and when you're focused, I'm learning this, you become selective. What do you mean, Pastor, selective? I'm selective what I watch and what I listen. I'm selective who I hang around with. I'm sorry. I can't hang around. I can't ever, I've learned this. You can't, you can't be everybody's best friend. That's right. That's right. You try to be, and you do everything because you want everybody to like you, but not everybody's going to like you. Yeah, that's but there's something going on. It will. But I've learned. I'm selective of what I entertain on social media, what I put on my phone. Why? Because I can let everything get in here, and my focus becomes widespread. Or I could become purpose, meaning what? Aimed and driven. You see, to be purpose, like this morning, you didn't show up here, you were around around the French Quarter drunk this morning, maybe, uh, I don't know, and you said, hey, there's a church down in Vala, I think I'm going to go to it, and I walk in stumbling. That can happen. The Holy Ghost can do that. I've seen it done many times. But most people this morning, you were coming here, you were, try, you were doing your best. You may be like me, on your shirt last night and put your pants out what you were going to do. Right? You knew the green bridge was either going to be broken or whatever, and you were going to go around. You aimed it. Uh, these two, uh, Carl and Laurie, uh, they were doing communion. I called them yesterday. I said, hey, man, look, we're doing communion. You know, the bridge is out. He said, Pastor, I don't care if the bridge is out. I'm driving through New Orleans East. I'm going to pray Psalms 91 when I drive through New Orleans East. <laughs> but I'm going to pray through. He said, but listen, me and Laurie are going to be here tomorrow. I said, that's my love. He said, brother, we are purpose. We are coming down here tomorrow. We're not showing up to church. Said, Man, we just don't know why we're here. They purposed it. They said, listen, unless something happens out of we can, we are coming here. You see, it's aimed. It's driven. And, Paul, and, and the word says this, that Paul says this, that when you have purpose, it motivates you in life. Purpose will always produce passion. And the enemy will take passion away because he wants to take your joy away. And when your joy is taken, you don't know what, oh, what is, uh, I don't know what. But when you're, when you're purpose-driven about things, you have passion. And passion brings fire inside of you. And passion has to be stirred. And at times that the enemy would like to do is take away your passion because he wants to steal your joy. Say joy you got to know he's attacking one area, the joy, because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And if I could take the joy out of you, there goes your strength. There goes your fight. You won't fight for your marriage. won't fight for this. won't fight for your... You just go, oh, well, it is what it is. I guess that's it. Heck no. Don't fall for that thing. Listen, I've learned, listen, when you have passion... You just have energy and just do it because it's inside of you. It's like, uh, I think Jeremiah, the word Jeremiah, I know, it says, it, the word is like fire in my bones. You know, when something gets in your bones, medically speaking, you could be done. But also spiritually, when fire gets in your bones, you can light up a room. See, you got to reverse the thing and go, okay, this is in my bones, but also I believe that the word of the Lord is in my bones. You see, I have to do that. You, have, you got to. Why? Because your biggest battle is not out there. Your biggest battle right here. Amen. Say amen. Amen. This is a quote. This is a quote I got. This is a quote I seen in his book by uh, George Bernard Shaw. It says, this is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose, recognized by yourself as a mighty one, and a force to be reckoned with. Man, come on, man. Paul just had this in his thing. It, it's not. It's not this feverish, selfish, cold, little clot of alignment and grievances complaining to the world that will not devote itself to making you happy. And we're saying, you said, the world don't owe you nothing. And the world's not responsible for making you happy. 
So don't look to the world and think that the world is going to fulfill you and do it. It will leave you empty. Because, listen, joy is deep-seated. Happiness is surface level. You know what happiness is? I'm going to tell you what happiness is. This is Pastor D's version. Happiness is getting a new car and the new car smell, and then the joy sinks out when you get your first payment. <laughs> you ride around that car. Lord Jesus, it smells good, this new car smell. Oh, Lord, today. And all of a sudden, you get the Chase Bank. This is your 84 payments. 84? I thought it was 64. No, it was 84. And then you got, and, that's, and guess what? There went your happiness. Amen? But joy is deep-seated, meaning nothing can take it away from you. Not blood clots. Not things the doctor told you. Not fear about maybe you losing your job, or this or that, or do, do we take the shot or not, and all the above. That, listen, honey, life's bigger than that. Like, listen, I'm learning life's short, and you will spend more time on the other side of life than you will here. So Paul said, what I'm doing now is preparation for a big dance that one day I'm going to go to. Amen? But how you handle it here is how well you will dance up there. Or if you will dance up there. Amen. Amen. Really, you know, I've learned this, that you know, we so focus on the here and now, but the big picture there is eternity. That where you end up at, because you will spend, life is like a vape, a vapor, like a blink of an eye. It's here, then gone. And so I'm learning, and I haven't got there yet, and I'm, God, I'm learning this. I got to learn not to focus on stuff that don't really matter. And my wife tells me this. I haven't got it yet. I'm in Bonnie School 101. I haven't graduated yet. I'm still on that thing. <laughs> but listen, d don't major on the minor minority things of life, on the minus. Sometimes we major on the minus stuff. He yeah. said, go fight a hill that's worth fighting for, D. D, your kids are worth fighting for. Go fight that hill. Yeah. Don't fight about who wore the same clothes last week. Don't fight about all that. Don't fight about you got nothing in the way. Don't fight about stuff like that. Fight about your kid struggling. Fight about that. Fight about that. We got to find purpose of why we have to fight for things. Number four is this. You were playing for God's pleasure. You realize you were playing for God's pleasure? I never knew that. I'm going to give you the word. I got shock and revelation. You were for his pleasure. Your marriage and everything else, that's just the benefits of who he is. But you were born for his pleasure and for his purpose. Do you realize that? Yeah. Why is that so important? Because why? When you're born for his pleasure and his purpose, you now demolish an argument in your mind. And what is the argument? The argument is that you, be, uh, the argument is that you are worthy and of value yeah. and that you're not you know you're not you are significant the problem with today is this we have a world that has an identity crisis that they feel like they're insignificant they're insignificant they can't figure out what gender are they uh -huh. come on we have an identification crisis in america that kids are now in school and they're being taught that you decide what you want to be god don't make mistakes And so we have an identity crisis, and it's traveling through our kids, and they don't know who they are. And the world's telling them they, they are it. No, you, you, you are a son and daughter of the Lord. Amen. You see, a son can never be a slave, and a slave can never be a son. And so you have to speak that you are not a mistake. You are a son and daughter of the Lord, and he knows your name. You, listen, he thought about you before you had any input. He didn't even ask you for the input. He just created you, and you are marvelously and fearlessly and wonderfully made. 
when that happens, you take away an identity crisis and you wipe out because now you get the, now we get the selective where on a birth certificate you can leave a blank and let they let them decide later on what they want to be, male or female. It's an identity crisis, and the Church of Jesus Christ should not have an identity crisis. You ought to know who you are in Christ. And Paul said, look, listen, you were born for his pleasure and purpose. Let me go to Revelations here. Let me go, let me get him ahead. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Maybe. You are worthy, O oh Lord, you are worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things, and they exist because you created them with what, with what you pleased, your pleasure and your purpose. He says, you created me. And let me say, God created you so much that he would love to have you for eternity. Wow. That's a revelation I got from the Holy Ghost. You were created and loved by him so much that he created you that you would be with him for eternity. Oh, if he did not, listen, if he did not, that alone, that alone gave me revelation. That was the Holy Ghost right there. I don't know what I said again. I have to repeat it. Go back and repeat the message. But it's true that he loved you so much that he planned on having you with him for eternity. Amen. Can you grab that alone? That's powerful. If, you're not, if you don't think you're that loved, that somebody would have you for them for eternity and, let you, and talk to you and, 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 and share things with you, my goodness, you are, you are not a mishap. You are not a mistake. You were born for his pleasure and purpose. You were born that you would worship him and give him thanks and give him glory because of who he is. Not but what he can do. It's the difference of being a savior. He's a savior from the pits of hell. Lord meaning what? Lord means what? He owns everything. He is everything. See, th th this world will tell you that you're insignificant, that you don't matter. Even in the church. If I don't come to church, I don't matter. They'll just miss me. I just they don't want to even... And, you, and then the enemy would tell you that, and you stay out of church, and they say, who told you that? Who told you that you were not valued? Who told you that, listen, when you, sh when you don't show up, you make a difference. It's a difference. It's a difference. Amen? You were born for his pleasure and purpose. And you were born to be, you listen, you were born to make, be significant in this life. To make a difference. You may not change the whole world, but guess what? You might be significant to change the whole, your whole family. Yes. Yes. See, you, you, I, I, I hope in this life that Pastor D and Bonnie, we may have not changed the whole world, but I hope we changed some families here for the better. Yes. Yes. I hope we made an impact in somebody's life. That somehow or another, because of Bonnie D, that you changed the way I think. Because why? You were willing to pour yourself out as a drink offering, and you didn't care what long as Christ won in your life. See, you want to be significant in life that, you be, that, that your family talk about you as a legacy. But you see, you can't, you can't live a legacy without, you can't leave one without living one. That's Holy Ghost. That's Holy Ghost. That's Holy Ghost. You, people, uh, I don't know if I said it again, I'm going to try to get it. Man, like, boom, boom. Okay, I get it now. Here we go. You can't leave one without living one. Listen, it's true. Bellary is this truth. I know I watched Bellary and, and I see a legacy. Why? That when, we, we, when this life takes us on, the Lord doesn't tarry and come back, that they'll talk about me and Bonnie for the next 20 years, my kids and my grandkids' people. You know what? They may have been the best preacher in the world, but you know what? Boy, they just, they just believe what they said. That, that brother D, he had passion down to his little toe. Yeah. He'll preach with blood clots. <laughs> That's right. That's right. He'll preach with blood clots. Why? Because it's in my spirit. It's in my bones. Yeah. And I'm hoping in life that on my tombstone one day, they'll say, you know what? He loved the Lord wholeheartedly. Yeah. I don't care what you said, but he loved, I don't know about all this and that. He, he's, he did this. He was, he, was, he was a nut sometimes. But you know what? I know when I know that I know that he loved the Lord wholeheartedly. And what he believed, he preached and lived. Yes, that's what God, that's the purpose. Yeah, you're going to mess up. Yeah, you're going to do all this. Yeah, it's all trivial stuff. The bottom line is, when you leave this earth, 
How would he talk to you? How would he remind yourself? I told my kids, I want my kids and my grandkids to talk about me. You know, even at school, I go across school. You know, they didn't even know my name. They know me as Pastor Parsi. <laughs> they, got on, they got on the phone. At the, at, the, on the, at the phone at the school, they don't have Derek Butcher. They got AKA Pastor Parsi. <laughs> it's true. She said, I wanted to go to your church, but I looked it up. I said, what's his name? Pastor Parsi. I said, he's, no, what am I doing? There's no Pastor Parsi on, the, on, 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 on online. And so she called me. She said, I want to come to your church, but what is your name? <laughs> I said, my name is Derek. Oh, my God. She said, I, I, I put down Pastor Parsi <laughs> on, on, on a slip to get my kid out of school. She saw this Pastor Parsi, checked him out. But you know what? That's what they believe, so be it. Come on. I'll close out with this. Jesus said this. Jesus said this. And Jesus answered the crowd, the Pharisees and all that. What is the greatest law? What is the greatest commandment? What is this? What is, what is your purpose, Jesus? Why do you come? He said, it's the purpose to love the Lord your God with all every passion of your heart. Amen. Here's your purpose, to love the Lord God with every passion of your heart and with all the energy of your being and with every thought that is within you. This is the greatest sense of supreme commandment. And the second was just as important as the first, to love your friend, your neighbor, as yourself. Yes. Grace purpose, that you would love the Lord, God, with all your heart, all your energy, all your mind, all your spirit. That you would put him above everything else, let him take care of everything else in the process. Let him, let him be, num let, listen, let him be number one. And it's hard to say this, and let everything else be a distant second. Including your wife and your kids. Lord, your purpose in life is that you would bring hope to a dying world and that you would be the light in the middle of your darkness. And that somehow or another they would see joy of the Lord in you when you're going through one of your most trying moments and say, what is it that you have that I don't? It's Jesus. What do you have in you that makes you just keep going instead of doing a Peter Pan off the bridge? It's to Christ him. It's the joy of the Lord. But why? Because joy is deep-seated. And happiness, like a parade last night, comes and goes. And Paul said this life purpose is that let no one steal your joy and let him be your joy. And if he's your joy, everything else will, everything else will work itself out. Amen? Amen. Life purpose. Not to be the greatest meter reader in the world, greatest mailman here or there. Purpose is why you were there, that you became a light. You may not preach on the top of platform. You may, you may not even be like Pastor D, but you lived the life that people said that man had something in him that was different. And what it was, it was the Christ standing at your feet. Amen. Amen. Jesus. Life purpose. You were significant. This morning, I'm just before we close, I'm just gonna just we, I'm, gonna, I'm going to break some word curses off of you this morning. Some people here today. This may not even be for you. No big deal. Maybe somebody else. But you know what? It's gonna be for somebody. And I'm gonna break a, a word curse or break off a, a, a myth, a lie that you were an accident, that you were insignificant. That you wasn't planned, you wasn't this or that, you were blot on the calendar, and we just lived with it. We were hoping for a boy, but we got you instead. I've heard that so many times. We were hoping for a boy, we were hoping for a girl. Yeah, and people would just tell you, but we got you instead. And that person goes, golly, so my dad tried to make me a boy and vice versa because he wanted the tomboy. You see what I'm saying? That's a warp, feel, that's a warp thinking, but guess what? It messed you up the rest of your life. So, Father, right now, I'm going to speak this over people this morning. This may be for you. Let, let somebody receive this this morning. I break off a word curse that you were an accident. Yes. For the word of the Lord will say to you that you're fearfully and wonderfully and marvelously made. So I take back thoughts and days where people spoke into your life, said you didn't matter, you didn't exist, you wasn't planned and all the above. That was a lie from the pit of hell. I overruled them because I gave you plan and purpose. I knew the time and date you were born. I knew the hospital. I knew everything about it. I had planned it, and nothing was an accident. 
So in the name of Jesus, I rebuke and take word curses off of you. That was, I was insignificant, I didn't matter, and I was of no value. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you that you had purpose. You had eternity. You were the apple. You were the pupil of his eye, David said. When you're the apple of somebody, you're the main focus or the main thing. You're the centerpiece. The Lord says, you're the centerpiece of my life. In so much that I was willing to spend eternity with you. I speak that over you in the name of Jesus today. Now I want you to lift your hands to the one and say, Lord Jesus, I surrender myself to you. I surrender completely to you. I was born for your pleasure and your purpose. So this day, Jesus, I ask you to be the purpose, be the center of my heart. And I say today, Jesus, be Savior of my soul. Be Lord. Be Lord of my life. And I speak this. And I receive this day. In Jesus' name. name. Amen. 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 Listen. (coughs) Enemy will tell you lies. And what happens is you will speak those lies to your children. And that's how a generational thing will start. So when you see your kids, you tell them that you know that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. And I know the enemy is distracting you with things going on. But the word that was in you will never leave you. Here it is. The word that was brought in you will never leave you. You You may go do your thing like prodigals do. Hey, it happens. But I believe that everyone, the word that was dialed in them deep, will cause them to come to their senses. And they'll realize who they are. And they'll come run back to the cross of Christ. I have to believe that. If not, there's no hope. Listen, I believe that all my heart. Listen, I can save the whole world. That's great, awesome. But I want to save my family too. And I believe you can do both. Focus, amen. Amen. Receive it today. Let the word get in you and let no one. Say, let no one one. rob me me of my joy. joy. In Jesus' name. name. Amen. Amen. Be blessed, Amen. amen.